Billy King Kong. Your curiosity quest starts here. Yo, what's up? Welcome into the Q Code Podcast. If I'm coming in, we all know what that means. It means he has something to say. <laughs> That he really wants. That he really wants to discuss. Perhaps <laughs> does it have to do with parcel delivery? If it does, I'm. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Not I just any old I'm parcel react. delivery. I've, automated. I've parcel never delivery. met a man that was so anti-parcel before. <laughs> just feel like. We don't need to have so many discussions about it. <laughs> you mean aside from every parcel delivery worker there is? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure they hate parcel. Because <laughs> they have to freaking deliver all the boxes. Or do they like but it? But do they like it because it gives them food. Job security. And a roof over their head. No. Nobody, <laughs> nobody actually just loves delivering boxes. <laughs> It might give you money, but it doesn't mean you have to love doing it. All right. So what is your topic then? So not topic, but you just, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Psych. It is not about parcel (laughs) delivery. This is psych. Yes, like freaking 1995. (laughs) Psych. (laughs) (laughs) This is actually almost the opposite. Of parcel delivery. It's parcel theft? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a story, but it did make me think of all the other parcel delivery ones. <laughs> but this has to do with Uber Eats. Oh, so it is some type of delivery <laughs> service. It's just do, you, do you ever use Uber Eats, Trev? No, we use DoorDash if we do. That's true. It. I do too. Yeah, I, I'm a Door, DoorDasher upper. Well, I was at work once, and my coworker, in the, like in the middle of the night, at the ER. That's the only thing, like way he can get food. So he ordered, like I think it was Taco Bell or McDonald's or something like that for for Uber Uber, Uber Eats. Yeah, I deliver. think McDonald's does Uber Eats, and uh, then Wendy's does DoorDash. Yeah, but so two hours went by, and his food never came. <laughs> <laughs> and so they like it was slow enough they sent me to go so like can you drive to McDonald's do you want to drive to McDonald's and like ask them did the guy ever even pick up his order and <laughs> well, then if not to- could you pick up the order and so I drove all the way to McDonald's and they're like no nobody ever came and picked up the order I was like can I pick it up like no you're not authorized <laughs> to pick up the order so then I just had to pay out of my own pocket and order the same things and then have them like Venmo me the money later. Well, they should have been so able. And Uber Eats never nothing ever happened. No, we don't know what happened to the guy. Did they get Did their they money back? Because do we have to pay for yeah, it? Yeah, he like he like put in for a refund on it and got the refund. But it was like no, there was no number to call customer service or like why did my food not come? <laughs> Usually, there's some type of message. That's I like. We haven't used Uber much but there's ways to do that because i mean long story short something similar to that happened except we were able to track like okay the food was picked up but now i see that the car is literally going the opposite direction (laughs) of me (laughs) and uh by the time it gets back to me my food's gonna be cold now yeah so we messaged uh whatever and they were like okay here's your refund and whatever but um i just remember before you get on with this uh a few years ago your brother, Steve, called me up. He probably called you guys up, too, and was like, I have a genius idea. Melanie is always home, but she has the kids, so she can't go out and get the groceries or or food or anything like that. What if we did a service that's like, uh, I don't know, like a taxi service, but they go and pick up the food for you at any fast food restaurant or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And I was at first I was like, you know what? That sounds like a good idea, Steve. But you know what? I have zero dollars to invest in your uh, <laughs> <laughs> in your idea. So we might just have to table that. <laughs> now here it is. <laughs> Now it's like a multi-billion dollar. I wonder industry. if like any time like he just sees Uber Eats or DoorDash, he's just pissed off. <laughs> Ah, I'm the real Napster. Uh, Probably. I do remember him. I don't know. He's had a lot of things, ideas that he's come up with. I don't remember 
I, that does sound familiar. I, to though. this day, will claim that I invented memory foam mattresses <laughs> only Why? in my head. But uh, I, was like, I was like seven. Because you have a memory of it? Who? No. <laughs> I do have a memory of it. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I just remember thinking, because I had one of those stress balls, and I'm like, you know, squeezing it. And I was like, what if? What if there was like a whole mattress of this material? It's like, that would be so soft. And I remember trying to explain it to my grandma, and she just didn't get it. She just thought, mm-hmm. like, I'm not the material that the ball is made out, but she just thought, like, a mattress literally made of these balls. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I just don't think that that would be very comfortable. I'm like, Grandma, <laughs> it's not the actual ball. It's like, say you get a giant ball <laughs> that's the size of a bed, but then you just cut out a slice. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Well, if we're going on things that we invented or came up with, <laughs> This is definitely I not what you specifically just... remember way before. I mean, this is even before DVDs even were a thing. I was like, I would record shows on VHS and I'd be like, do you know what? I wish that someone would come out with something where they would just give me all the episodes of a show on a tape. And here we are a few years later, they have DVDs with full seasons. And now they well, have even now, <laughs> so I'm like, even now they're like, becoming obsolete it's like why why even have a dvd well, you know, on but my the shelf, idea but. was like i just want to have all this episodes in it. like i would literally make vhs tapes of shows that i liked and i would but i would i would literally try to look up like so i'd have to like write on the tape itself i'd be like all right uh season two episode seven season six episode four like i think i tried it with seinfeld Mm. But like they were helter skelter because they never played them necessarily in order. <laughs> so they're, so they're just reruns, <laughs> other than what they say in Beagle, helter in, skelter <laughs> in a summer swelter. <laughs> no helter skelter, isn't that mean? Just like all over the place? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Why couldn't you just say all over the place? <laughs> <laughs> you had to say helter skelter. Helter skelter sounds better. <laughs> Anyway, that's just the difference between us and millionaires <laughs> is the fact that we have ideas, but yet have we zero don't, know how we, of we how to execute make them. them. It takes money <laughs> to make money. But true. True. these. All right. So what is this? So thing about Uber, Uber Eats. <laughs> <laughs> so what it is, is did you know that Uber Eats now in select cities, I believe is like Dallas and a few other cities is offering a service that's called Uber Eats Dine-In. And this is where <laughs> do they come pick you up and just take you to the? <laughs> this is so where just normal. <laughs> you actually order your Uber Eats, and then but you say I want to dine in, and then you just say I want I'm going to be there at five o'clock, and you show up at the restaurant, and your food is just waiting for you at the table. You just sit down at a table and start eating. <laughs> so it's like so, it's like a reservation, but taken. They just take one the, additional step, step of making yeah. sure that the food is ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to wait there at the table. Although so you're it does literally bring up the question. saving yourself 15 minutes. Yeah. That way you don't have to stand in line is, is what they're well, But saying. if you already had a reservation, you should be able to yeah. get in there and just get to your table. All you have to do is just but look at the menu and don't order. don't have reservations. Like, say you go to a fast food restaurant. Oh, okay. I get that. And you're just like, now I just want to be able to sit, get in there, sit down, eat my food. But Uber eats. McDonald's. If I was a homeless person, this would be a dream come true. <laughs> gonna dine in at McDonald's. I would just be like waiting for them to be like, oh, they put it down. I'm like, yes, I'm Mr. Johnson, <laughs> and just eat the food really quick. That's mine. <laughs> All right, sir. What is your uh, confirmation number? Look, I don't have it, <laughs> but all I know is that I ordered. Just be uh, like two Big Macs. <laughs> Carry a dead iPhone and be like, my phone died, so... <laughs> he gets his no one can see Trap, but he's over here acting like he's looking over <laughs> some barrier and trying to identify the different items of food <laughs> that also, are located on the table. Also a... Uh, s- strawberry... Bicemic sh- chicken? Sh- <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's just a regular that's just That's weird. I mean, like, I get it, but... So, but yeah, they're going to try and do that. And then if it's successful, I think they're going to try and implement a way that actually in the app, when you order your food for dine in, it will automatically order an Uber to come pick you up from where you're at, mm-hmm. at the certain time to take you there and deliver you. At I just thought but, that you were going to be, <laughs> you're going to stop at the fact that it's like dine in where Uber will come and pick you up and take you to the restaurant. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're like, <laughs> that's pretty much that's what they have now. <laughs> basically, Uber. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was thinking kind of a diff- the other route. I was like, are they going to like drive employees of that restaurant with all the food, kind of like a catering service to your house, and then they just serve you there? They like pull out table. like a like a tablecloth. Yeah. And- they make it all fancy. Make it all nice and light a couple candles or like, your dinner is Like if served. it's a Chinese restaurant, <laughs> they bring like little Chinese decor to make the ambiance in your house. <laughs> so that, if that I were to... cat that does this. I know you can't see it, but... <laughs> <laughs> the lucky the, the cat. The cat that just has one arm that swivels yeah. back and forth. It's supposed to be like lucky for like money or something oh. like that. I thought it was a cat that wanted a high five like all the time. <laughs> I think he's just still in your change. <laughs> Wait, real quick. The Manson family. The murders that they did were they just completely random and they had no like... <laughs> Where is this going? <laughs> is this stemming from Helter Skelter? Yeah. Okay. Because I looked this up. The Helter Skelter scenario is a theory put forth by Vincent Buglosi. Is my dog... <laughs> my dog is snoring. Garrett! Garrett! So, the Helter Skelter scenario is a theory put forth by Vincent Belogoski, lead prosecutor in the, the Tate LaBianca murder yeah, trial, if you to really, explain the series of murders committed by the Manson family. Yeah, if you really wanted to get into it, which we that's a long thing, but uh, basically, Mar- Marilyn. Uh, the Manson. Yeah. <laughs> What's his name? Manson. Charles? Charles Manson believed that there were hidden messages in in the Beatles songs that were directed at him. And so he used Helter Skelter as something, and they they even spelled it wrong because they wrote it in blood on the wall. They spelled it wrong. But anyway, yeah, most of them were pretty kind of random, but uh, the Tate murders were, were, they were, he told them to go and do that. But uh, anyway. Uh, That could be for a whole nother episode. But we do have a good episode today. Quickly, though, before. (laughs) This is why our episodes go two hours. Uh, So, really fast, just a trivia question, okay, Trav and Alan? If you guys had to guess, what would be the most popular hotel reservation in the past week? Would you guess A, the Hilton, B, the... Four, four stars season in. It's not that. C. <laughs> 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 Motel Six and or D. Hotel Taco Bell. Which one would you say? Is there a Hotel Taco Bell? Well, that's the question. Which one do you think it is? Motel Six. Alan. Hotel Taco Bell. Ding 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 ding. It's Hotel Taco Bell. <laughs> What the heck is Hotel Taco Bell? <laughs> yeah. And where is this coming from? <laughs> what does this have to do with anything? <laughs> I'm think, about ready to move on <laughs> to the show. And Dan, this this is the thing that is important enough to stop the show. And be like, hey, wait, 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 wait. I've got a trivia question about Hotel Taco Bell. <laughs> I just thought we were going Helter Skelter, so we were just jumping all over the place. <laughs> well, we so know Al. Thought- <laughs> so I just thought I'd let you know that there is a Hotel Taco Bell that is opening in August in Palm Dell or Palm Springs, Florida, and they have seventy rooms. They're going to be open for one week, then they're going to be gone. What? But their reservation sold out in two minutes for the whole week. Okay. <laughs> At $169 per night. There better be some freaking Taco Bell on my pillow when well, I get it. Kind of a ho- what kind of a hotel lasts for a week? <laughs> it's a pop-up heck? hotel. Care. It's like apparently it's a thing. I don't know. But oh, Okay, whenever there's, there's a big event in some place, they'll pop up a hotel. Well, I guess apparently Taco Bell is super popular amongst people. There's like fans of Taco Bell. So if you go to Hotel Taco Bell, you can look forward to tasting Taco Bell's take on the V Palm Springs restaurant menu created by Renee Piscotti, the same product developer who invented nacho fries. I do like nacho fries. <laughs> Among the potential menu options, a grilled chicken Caesar salad that okay. includes croutons crafted. Okay. On a we, we don't we care about that. <laughs> we do not care about their stupid menu. Chav's face is just says I, I would like to talk about <laughs> right. what we planned on talking about today. 
<laughs> We're already 15 minutes into this. <laughs> I didn't know you we have hated Taco Bell so much. That was this. That was see. No, the problem was is that <laughs> that was an addition, an additional <laughs> beginning topic that we did not know about, and that was a surprise <laughs> that we could care less about. Just, I feel like we already went through the whole motion yeah. with the Uber Eats dining in option, and I was already moving on. You could have just let it go, but he's like, no, wait, I have to talk about Hotel Taco Bell. Have to. If I do not talk about Hotel Taco Bell, this episode is why even why even, why even have it? Why even record? So, <laughs> didn't you have something you want to talk about, Trav? No, not anymore. <laughs> okay, and it's nowhere near the food topic. <laughs> <laughs> so we could talk about it later. All right, but, let's get into the show. You're right. Trav. So yeah, we do have. Three questions. <laughs> Start out with Dan's question, which who knows what that's going to be. I mean, it says here on the on the paper, but you never know what he'll say. But it is, uh, what is the Canadian crypto scandal? Uh, we'll then move on from that to Alan's question, which is, what is the Canadian maple syrup heist? <laughs> Trav, come on. Three for three. They did this last week. They're like, oh, Trav, we need like another Canadian topic. <laughs> It was like, I don't just, I don't have like a bag of Canadian topics. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm going to disappoint. But uh, then my question is, who would you bring back? And we'll actually kind of just leave it at that. Okay. Until we get there. So sweet. Well, should we just jump into my question then? Yes, please. No, God! (laughs) No, God, please, no! 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 Hello, darkness, my old friend. What the hell is going on right now? All right. So that was apparently some dude's like um, example of how in an auditory format you could represent Bitcoin. <laughs> like, if, so it was like if you matched a graph, graph of its price to the pitch, so like low to high, yeah, it's going up. It gets it gets higher and higher, but and then, then it, it has crashes. a crash. And you would think, like, watching it, because there's a visual part, like a bar going across, so it gets higher and higher, and then you think, oh, it's going to crash, and it'll just go back to low a frequency, <laughs> but then it goes, no! 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 <laughs> it's like, this is what Bitcoin would sound like. And then, it, <laughs> and then it plateaus. It's like, hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> and then it just ends. All right. So, I but I, I thought it would... Uh, Honestly, I I didn't even realize how funny it would be to watch Trav go through that, even though I thought it would be funny. <laughs> he looked, his face was so confused. confused. <laughs> Can you well, blame I think me? Anybody, I think anyone who's person. listening to this is going to be confused. They're not going to just be like, oh yeah, Bitcoin. <laughs> that oh, yeah, definitely this represents perfectly sums up the Canadian crypto scandal. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> All right. right. So <laughs> just to forewarn, going into this, there was not like a ton that I could find, um, even though, because the topic seemed kind of interesting. So I'm going to go through it. We'll just do our best to talk about the limited amount of stuff that there was. We so. do this a lot. There's not a lot, but <laughs> guaranteed we will talk about it for 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And how many pages of notes do you have this time? Just a few. But good heavens. <laughs> but no, so seriously, uh, cryptocurrency. This is one thing that I know um, one of Alan's coworkers requested at some point saying, hey, you should do a show on cryptocurrency. Alan came to me and said, hey, that's funny. You just said that you want to do a show on uh, the, crypt- the Canadian crypto scandal. So I said, well, I'll give a quick brief description, but we're not going to go into it super deep. But in a future episode... It's like future episode. We'll uh, try and 
maybe do a question specifically more geared towards crypto and maybe try and pull in somebody who's more of a specialist on cripple crip <laughs> on cri- cripple currency. Crippled currency <laughs> currency. <laughs> Cryptocurrency. Say that five times fast. So this is your cryptocurrency crash course. Sorry, I just see crippled currency as like a dollar bill but just has the handicap sign. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You should be laughing. (laughs) We shouldn't be. I mean, technically, the term is not handicap. Is is not was it un PC? Because the word handicap comes from literally hand in cap. So, like, if you were like a disabled person, a lot of times you were homeless. So you're out on the street, had a cap in your hand, asking for money. So that's where handicap comes from. Oh, really? So So when you say handicap, it is actually yes, that's derogatory, and it is. So, like yeah. disabled, I guess is probably the what more PC. But anyway, okay. or, or differently abled, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, in ten seconds or less, do either of you guys know what cryptocurrency is? How would you describe cryptocurrency? Digital money that is has weird names. Okay, that's pretty accurate. What else, Jeff? <laughs> or what else, Al? Digital money that, but the crypto I would say would stem from like secret. Not traceable, very anonymous. Good. Very good. Both of you guys are pretty close. So cryptocurrencies have four commonalities, right? So you can classify something as a cryptocurrency if it meets these four criteria. One, it's on a blockchain. Got it. A blockchain is a system in which a record of, of transaction a tran- I can't talk transactions are maintained across several computers that are linked in a peer-to-peer network. Two, they're decentralized, which means that there's no central bank. It's not like the government where there's a central bank that runs all of the currency or that, you know, is in charge of all of it. Instead, this is something that is, there's not, it's not all in one server or anything. It's split up amongst a whole bunch of different peers and a whole bunch of different computers. And that's why it, you can go back to any of those and kind of retrace like what happened or where things have been or what transactions took place. Mm-hmm. And then, in order to steal it, you'd have to change everyone's record. Three, it's immutable, uh, okay. which means uh, once a transaction occurs and it's on the record, you can't change it. It's That's it. It's there forever. Wait, what did you say? Mutable? It's immutable. Oh, immutable. Four, it's trustless, meaning like, if, for example, if you go out and you write a check to some, or somebody writes you a check and buys something from you, you kind of have to trust that there's money in their account, right? Yeah. Well, if you get cryptocurrency, you know the transaction. Once it's complete, that's it. Like, they can't I'm writing you a check for three Bitcoin. Yeah. And there's also other platforms. <laughs> <laughs> three Bitcoin. Go, go cash this. <laughs> but there's also like, uh, what is it called? Uh, Ethereum is another type of cryptocurrency. And they have platforms built now where, for example, you can set up a contract with somebody and say, hey, you complete this job, then this cryptocurrency will get transferred to you so it's kind of out of the other person's hands it's like kind of like in a middle ground and it's just waiting for you to complete the job and then you get the current cryptocurrency automatically so you know you'll get paid hmm. if you do it so that's kind of that cryptocurrency though also has concerns and those concerns are anonymity anonymity <laughs> anonymity anonymity, yeah, anonymity. anonymity. That's anonymity. what did I say anonymity <laughs> I don't know Half the words you're saying today do not make sense. <laughs> but anyway, so the downside of this is that you don't always you don't know who you're dealing with. Like you don't know who's on the other end of the transaction because it's completely anonymous, uh, or it can be completely anonymous. Much, much like those chat rooms we just talked yep. about. <laughs> uh, immutability, immutability, <laughs> immutability. <laughs> How do you say that, Trev? Immutability. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, immutability. Also, immutability. also talking to your microphone. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying so hard. This is like when, do you guys remember like being in school and they're like, okay, we're going to go around the room and read. Like everyone's going to read one paragraph. I yeah. hated that because twofold. One, I had to pay attention and know where we were. <laughs> That's the reason they do it. <laughs> yeah, true. You are the exact reason <laughs> they do that. And two, like I was so worried like that I wouldn't know a word or how to read a word 
when it got to my turn. That's why you count ahead. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say. So I would always be like, okay, I think. But then if they would all of a sudden change like the order or like a kid would leave. Then like, God no. forbid you read a paragraph. <laughs> <gasps> but then if I didn't know a word, I'd be scared. So anyway, immutability, immutability. It's, a mis- it's basically... <laughs> If a mistake is made, you can't reverse it. So it goes back to the same thing that we talked about before. (laughs) But this is like a case where it's like, yeah, dang it. I did not mean to send that cryptocurrency to Trav, but now I'm screwed. Unless Trav's willing to just send it back to me. Like there's nothing I can do about it. Free money. It's like Vegas. If you accidentally leave your chips on the, on the betting, whatever. Yep. Yep. You're you're screwed. And then the hand is dealt. You're like, you can't take it back. Then you're just hoping you get dealt a 21. Yeah. All right. Liquidity could be an issue. So basically, if you don't have anywhere to spend your cryptocurrency or nobody's willing to take it, then there's no value to it, right? So you always have to have enough liquidity. And then a lack of uniform regulation. So there is no governing body over cryptocurrency currently. Governments are scrambling right now to just even figure out what it is, how to categorize it, how to govern it, and they're but no one does right now. So mm. you don't have but someone like to go to. Isn't that the whole point of it is why are they trying to figure out how to govern it? The point is like, it's not governed, right? Well, yeah, no. So you would have two different, uh, camps. One's definitely in that camp. Yeah. And there's others that are in the camp of like, well, but we need to have some kind of like something watching over it or some kind of rules that go with it or else people can, can, can get screwed over if that makes sense yeah Karen. <laughs> <laughs> he's snoring so loud <laughs> so by the way that was a clap he did not hit my dog <laughs> <laughs> if you go to our instagram page he has his own icon because he's here he's just not recording necessarily <laughs> always with us but he's always in the background yep he snores a lot though I want to have them checked out. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So that's cryptocurrency in a nutshell. So what's a cryptocurrency exchange? An exchange is like the stock market exchange. It's just somewhere people can go and conduct trades. They can go and, you know, you can find a buyer and a seller and they put them together and then you can have a transaction. So there's a company called Quadriga CX uh, that is a cryptocurrency exchange that was founded in Canada by a Gerald Cotton and cri- Quadriga CX grew. <laughs> you have to roll your R's when you say it. <laughs> it probably isn't because it's not Spanish. Huh? And is, is it, it French? Is it it's also just quadriga. one R? Is it yeah. just one R? Then you don't need to roll your. <laughs> so you just say quadriga? <laughs> yeah. Quadriga. Quadriga. <laughs> there is a Canadian <laughs> company called Quadriga. <laughs> Abierto los domingos. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good point. Okay, so Quadriga CX uh, quickly grew to be the largest cryptocurrency exchange in Canada. So to sum that up, founded by Gerald Cotton, quickly grew to be the largest one in Canada. (laughs) Way to go, Cotton. (laughs) Cotton Eye Joe. (laughs) So here's where the story begins, okay? So Quadriga or (laughs) Quadriga. This whole time I've been calling it Quadriga and it's hard to stop. <laughs> Quadriga CX <laughs> um, was also co founded by a guy named Michael uh, Patrin, and I'll come back to why that's important later in the story. Um, but ultimately, this place, this exchange, was able to build up about a quarter billion dollars in assets or people's funds that they invested into this company as far as they went in and said, yeah. I want to buy cryptocurrency through your exchange. And then they paid them probably Canadian dollars for the most part to get the cryptocurrency and then kept it in their accounts on the cryptocurrency exchange. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, that became the largest. Well, this uh, CEO, Gerald Cotton, in an er- interview in 2015, so basically what I'm going to do now is just tell you guys the happenings that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I say doubled words all the time, but anyway. (laughs) 
So in an interview in 2015, uh, in an article from Coindesk, the CEO, Gerald Cotton, stated that Quadriga, Quadriga uses a two of three multi-signature cold storage to secure the change, exchange's Bitcoin holdings. So what that means, <laughs> as I look at both of you guys just staring at me, is that when it comes to cryptocurrency, if you put it into a cold storage, which basically just means that you're putting it into something that's not connected to the internet anymore. You're like literally putting it into some kind of yeah. offline. Like an air-gapped yeah, system. Yeah, database. So this is you do this because it protects it from hackers. It's really just like somebody who's reading it off the internet and he just writes it on a scrap piece of paper and puts it in a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it's safe. You, Trust Trav me. Cole has four Bitcoin. <laughs> no, no one will ever look in this drawer. All right. So anyway, but basically, yeah, that's kind of what it is, except for on some kind of like hard drive or digitally. Something. Yeah. And so the only way that once it's on the cold storage to get access to it, because it's all encrypted, is you have to have the pass key. If you don't have the pass key code, then there's just nothing you can do about it. It's completely encrypted. And it's like, if I remember, I like Bitcoin is based on like a 99 character encryption or something like that, like some huge number. So it's like impossible to decipher, yeah. basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how you do it. But if you have a two, three multi-signature cold storage system, that means that you could have three keys. And if you have any two of the three, you can still get into it. Oh, So if something happens to one of them, as long as you have the other two, you can get into it. It's like ready player one. You need three keys ah. to get to three gates. Oh, yeah. And you get the prize. Except for you needed all three keys in that one. <laughs> so you're saying three different people have each... The, 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 so typically, yes. each have a key. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all, folks. <laughs> so yes, tip basically exactly. So like the two people, people on a nuclear submarine, they have to turn their keys at, at the same, same time. time. Yep. Okay. But this one is like, so yeah, you would give it to like three different head, you know, officers or something at your company. So that way, if like one something happens to one of them or they lose one of them, then they can still get in because. This is like basically all the funds that people have invested into this exchange that they're just holding it there. So yeah. it's not like it's theirs even per se. It's people, other their customers. You mm-hmm. know? And then there's a thing called hot wallets and you use hot wallets to actually move things around. So like they're actually connected to the internet. So that's how you're going to make trades. So you'll keep a certain amount of the funds in the hot wallet, right? <laughs> that's a funny word. <laughs> <laughs> Such a hot wallet. <laughs> <coughs> so, like, a bank has a vault, but then they also have money up at the hot wallet, like the teller station. <laughs> that they, uh, <laughs> I've been waiting this whole time. <laughs> that would just be their their commercial. <laughs> we, have, we have many different types of hot wallets. Hot wallets. <laughs> Are you sick of your cold storage? We got hot wallets. All right, so in. 2017, customers of Quadri- Quadriga CX started complaining about how, like, getting their, they wanted to make withdrawals, but the withdrawals were even happen or either happening very slowly or not happening at all. So some complaints started coming out, and this is when people started getting concerned. Well, in 2018, uh, the a large Canadian bank, CIBC. Uh, that Quadriga uh, had accounts at, their their majority of their accounts at, froze $20 million worth of their business checking accounts. So they could not access that money anymore. Well, they use that as the reason why people weren't getting their withdrawals. They're like, well, the bank has frozen our assets, like our funds, so we can't get it to you. We're, we're working on trying to get them released, right? So the bank came back and said... They froze the funds because a man named Jose Reyes, who was in charge at Quadriga CX of processing all the withdrawals, was trying to transfer $2.3 million of the company's funds into his personal account. So that was the reason the bank said that they froze the accounts because they felt like there was something fishy going on. Mm-hmm. Someone, so someone trying to like just steal from the company. Yeah. So they okay. called, so CIBC, the bank, tried to talk to the CEO, Gerald Cotton about what was going on and why the funds were frozen, but he refused to talk to them. Why would they freeze 20 million if he was trying to transfer like two, two I think point they, some? 
all of these funds, they just like felt like there was fishy, like they couldn't say deem like exactly where the funds came from. So they're wondering like whose funds are these? Where whose money is this? Like what's oh, really okay. going on? We got to stop. So all until this. we figure this out, no one gets in and no one leaves. Yeah, basically. Right. And so, um, but yeah, so he refused to talk to him, which is weird. You would think if you're the CEO of the company, you'd want to figure this out quick, right? So finally, after about a year, a year. In November of 2018, the matter finally kind of got solved in the court of law, and they were able to unfreeze the funds, and they end up distrib- ended up distributing that $2.3 million to Jose Reyes. Um, so I'm assuming like Gerald Cotton's like, no, that was fine. That was a legit transaction. Just transfer the funds there. They unfroze the account. So Quadriga then put out a statement saying, all right, now everyone who had withdrawals pending, you should be getting your withdrawals shortly. Well, those withdrawals never happened. So people, again, were like, what is going on? Okay. So this brings us to December 9th, 2018, about a month after the funds got. Wait, and all the while, like Bitcoin, the in cryptocurrency, doesn't the price goes up and, up and down like so fast, right? Yeah. So if you're like trying to get your money out of your cryptocurrency, and it's frozen for even a month. Like that could be a huge implications. They could go down five thousand dollars or up five thousand yeah. dollars, right? I would imagine that they would say, "Well, you traded it already on our system. You're going to get the credit for what you traded it at or sold it." Oh, out. okay, okay. Because <clears throat> hypothetically, the funds should then go back into their accounts that are now frozen, but they're actually dot like Canadian dollars. Yeah. Okay. So on December 9th, two thousand eighteen, Gerald Cotton, the CEO. Goes to India, okay, <laughs> <laughs> to help open an orphanage for children in need. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and then suddenly dies. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not nice. Of complications with Crohn's disease. And should I? I should mention at this point, Gerald Cotton's thirty years old. Okay, <clears throat> so he's one of the three key guys. Yeah, and supposedly he's now dead. So now he he dies. Uh, the interesting thing is, so Crohn's disease, for anyone who doesn't know, is a chronic inflammatory disease of the intestines, especially the colon and ileum, associated with ulcers and fitzule. <laughs> <laughs> I really should learn how to pronounce these words before we record. But if anyone knows what F-I-S-T-U-L-A-E is, you should let us know. <laughs> but the weird thing is that Crohn's disease typically is not fatal and especially in somebody who's like a healthy 30 year old like it's just very strange that he would just suddenly die from Crohn's disease like it's almost unheard of well it's finally his wife Jennifer Robertson doesn't release a statement telling anyone that he's no one even knows he's dead until over a month later on January 15th she releases a statement saying my husband was in India and died on December 9th so it's kind of strange that she would wait that long to announce that her husband died. Well, anytime you're eating Indian curry, you can kind of expect inflammation of your intestines. Maybe that's what did it. Smelling it. (laughs) (laughs) But it's so good. And then one other kind of tidbit is before, right before he died. So on November 27th, 2018, remember he died on December 9th. So less than two weeks before he died, Cotton created a will uh, stating that his wife would be the executor of his ex- estate, which included an airplane, property, their two dogs, and both those dogs were allocated $100,000 each for their ongoing care. Mm. So they're going to be living the good life. <laughs> I don't know, Trav. You're, you deal with dogs a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Why, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, how How good of a life would a dog have if they had a hundred thousand dollars at their disposal not good unless they had a human spending it for them yeah they can't do anything (laughs) they literally have no clue (laughs) it's like i'm starving to death and they're literally sitting on top of a hundred thousand dollars that's true well good thing his wife was in charge of spending that hundred thousand dollars for him on that okay all right so that's kind of what happened so since Cotton's death, this is kind of what, what's gone on. After Cotton's death, the company claimed that they did not know where the cold storage wallets were located. Remember, the cold storage wallets is where the, the funds should have been stored 
and should have been protected with the two of three key system, right? Um, but they claim that not only do they not know where they were stored, but that Gerald Cotton was the only one who possessed a key to access them. Mm. So they're now saying like, there was no two of three key system. Like literally he was the only one that had a key. It was a one of one key system, if you want to call it that. <laughs> Just a key system. Oh yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> I would, yes. One of one key. So there was, <laughs> there was a Reddit user uh, who was, I believe he was, um, you know, a member of this Quadriga CX who had lost some funds in there. So he decided to conduct a, what they call a chain analysis, which I basically, from what I understand, it's like they're going back through. So it's a blockchain technology that cryptocurrency is on, right? So they can kind of reverse engineer all the transactions to kind of find where things went. You yeah. Know? So I think he did a chain analysis and he was able to track down one of the cold wallets that was supposedly lost. And when he tracked it down, he could see that not only when he found it, but he could see that funds were being moved out of it. So if there's funds being moved out of the cold wallet, that means, that means that it's not the key is not lost. Someone mm. has the key and is using it and dun, moving dun, the funds. Dun. So now we're back to a two, possibly two of two or two of three system. Possibly. Someone just so basically it was a two of what was it three or two or three two of three two of three system, but some but the people just lied and said no, it's not. <laughs> Maybe so. People were curious about this, right? So they went to look into it. It's like, is this angel house orphanage thing that he went to India for? Is this like a, even a legit thing? Like, let's look it up. So they looked it up. Somebody was able to find a picture that like said, like showed up like a building that says angel house orphanage and it had Gerald Cotton's name on it and said that he was sponsoring it for 12 kids or whatever. Um, so they kind of figured, they figured like the angel house orphanage is a legit business in India. Um, so that was kind of solved. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing is people ask the following questions. So why did Gerald Cotton decide to sponsor a 12 child home in India when he had never shown himself to be a philanthropic guy in the past? So it costs like $22,000, almost $22,000 to sponsor a 12 child home. And yeah, like Gerald Cotton should be pretty rich, but he's just never shown to be philanthropic before. Another question is, why would he do this like in the midst of a bear market in cryptocurrency? So like right when his company is going to be struggling because it's cryptocurrency is crashing. Pro- yeah. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, did it have anything to do with the, <laughs> at that time, all the funds were being frozen? and Or was it after the funds were frozen that he went and did that? So he left just right after the okay. funds okay. were unfrozen. So Got it. Yeah. Um, and then why did he have to travel to India to do this project? Cause if you look on their website and apparently people like talk to the company and stuff, it's basically like, no, you just, all you have to do is send us your money. Like we just need the funds, but we have people here that like take care of everything, like set it up, get everything going, all that stuff. It doesn't require a person or Gerald Cotton, for example, to actually be there to do this. So that was another question is like, well, why when his company is in distress, like with the frozen funds and the com- customers complaining that they're not getting their withdrawals and all that stuff, would he just like leave and go to India to do this? Right. Mm-hmm. So it kind of opened up a lot of questions. So this brought people to think, okay, so maybe Gerald Cotton did what they call an exit scam, which is basically when you fake your own death. So now they're starting to put it together. Apparently guess which country uh, has one of the highest rates of fake de- death certificates available. India. Ding, 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 ding. So India is known to have a high rate of fake death certificates available, and you can easily purchase one for 450 US dollars. So it's not even that expensive. And they actually did the study where like a, um, a reporter from went over there and he tried to get a fake death certificate and he was able to get one no problem. Mm. So it's easy enough. So then this finally brings us back. So there's kind of that thought process. Well, if you guys remember, there was the co-founder, Michael Petrin, from the beginning that I was talking about. So when people started looking into this co-founder guy, Michael Petrin, it turns out that he had an alias previously known as Omar Danani. And Omar Danani was arrested in 2004 for being a member of the Shadow Crew. 
Mm. And what the Shadow Crew is, is a crew. Like the Foot Clan. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was just thinking of. <laughs> that's funny because that's what I thought too. <laughs> Who just snorted? It's Alan. <laughs> He loves the Shadow Crew. <laughs> shadow Crew. <laughs> so the Shadow Crew was founded in 2002, uh, and they it were was linked. Garen, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and they were linked to having traffic and stolen credit card information. So Omar Danani, uh, he what he did for the Shadow Crew is he ran an illegal currency exchange um, that basically provided a way for this illegal Shadow Crew to launder their money. So he was basically laundering their money for them. So eventually Omar was caught and he was convicted. So he spent a few years in prison. Well, he got out in 2008 and he immediately began a new exchange called the Midas Gold um, Exchange under the alias Omar Patrin online. And basically what the Midas Gold Exchange was, was just a very, very early cryptocurrency exchange. Um, And then sure enough, in about 2009, Midas Gold was shut down due to numerous complaints that customers who claimed that they never received their withdrawals from the company. Mm. So does this sound familiar? Yes. Yes. So it's just all come full circle, right? Okay. So what really happened? One theory. Did Cotton really die and this is all just one big coincidence? No. Two. Is Cotton really behind all of this and faked his own death? That would be... The most exciting one. <laughs> yeah, I believe. Three, <laughs> was Michael Patrin playing Cotton this whole time and was the one who set all of this up from the beginning. And then murdered him? And then <gasps> sent, told Cotton, hey, you need to go because they need your help setting up this thing and then had him killed in India. And then meanwhile, he had the key the whole time. That would be even more exciting than yeah. the other one. So, <laughs> Trav and Allen, final question. I don't, what do you guys think? <laughs> I don't know what Hotel Taco Bell is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> like after hearing all that, is there like, what uh, would the story that you would spin or that you would pull out of it be? Well, I feel like Omar Danani, which by the way, you say his name and all I can think of is that song on uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights where he's like, so I was just putting his name in it. So I was going, oh, Martinani, oh, Martinani, oh, Martinani, and a ho, ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I feel like he has to have something. Or, or he taught Cotton all about it, and then he just ran with it. But I'm going to say, I'm going to say option C. I'm going to go with Michael I'm going to go with the, with the whole setup and the murder thing. Oh, whoa, whoa, Let's whoa. do whoa. that one. <laughs> okay, Alan. <laughs> What do you think after hearing all those uh, facts or um, I'm whatever? Not, I think it's just, wait, was B where he just fakes his own death? Yes. Yep. I'm going to go with that one. It's going to be A. I don't think it was. <laughs> it's going to be A. <laughs> well, okay, I don't mean to disappoint you guys. No one knows the answer. Well, then what the crap? <laughs> These are just the speculations. <gasps> So this, this is an uns- stupidest. <laughs> this is an unsolved mystery, but I'm curious. Like just from what you, the facts that you can see there, you can piece together your own story, right? And I agree. Like I think there's to me, it feels like yeah, there's something between either Cotton's working with Michael Patrin and they're working hand in hand and they're together doing this whole thing, or is it possible? But that- is it possible that his wife is actually involved somehow? Because she became like the sole owner of his estate. Maybe <sighs> she, maybe his wife is working with Michael Patrin and they had him killed. And Wait, fair. when did you say, Ooh. when did you say like he <laughs> wrote his last will that left everything to the, to the wife and the dog? Less than two weeks before he died. So that's, hmm. The wife might have just killed him. Like, and then said somehow. he went to India. Like, well, I, sh- I shall kill you with Crohn's disease. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how like sent him to India and then killed him there or killed him and said he went to India or whatever but hmm. so maybe. basically I mean if you look back and you say okay so if that guy's correct the reddit dude and there really is money being taken out somebody has the key so we know there must be foul play at some point it's just a matter of is it Michael Patrin is it the wife wait so is it Gerald Cotton himself or is it just like somebody else that we don't even know about because so this, money is being taken out 
So, yeah, okay. yeah, but you you said it's on like a cold storage. Uh, so wouldn't you physically have to go there and connect to the cold storage device to get the cryptocurrency out? Yeah, so somebody knows where the cold storage is, and then also has. Oh, so it's not like I was imagining like some big server room in a office building somewhere. It's just like a little like hard drive box or something. I mean, I think they can be um, because people like personal people. That I was like, just check the security cameras and see who's going in the cold (laughs) storage room. (laughs) But yeah, no, I think it can. It can be a portable device. Oh, okay. but somebody has to have the key and the cold storage and able to pull the money funds out, put it in a hot wallet and make the trades. So hot wallet. Anyway, that's the, uh, Canadian wait, when you say key, are these like scandal. actual physical keys or are we talking key? Like no, a, they're like keys as in like, like Egyptian a code. Keys, like, code. Yeah. A code numbers. And, okay. Wow. Well, like a very long series then this, of random What numbers. I was imagining in my head was completely... I, w- I had like Mission Impossible type stuff going on in my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one part of Canada. So uh, let's journey to another part as we explore Alan's question, which is, what is the Canadian maple syrup heist? This is Butterworth. Yes. Tell me, what's the secret of your syrup recipe? Well, my syrup is made with real butter. It's very rich. And look how thick it is. See how long it takes Mrs. Butterworth to drip down this fat? My syrup's got to be thick to pour this slowly. Now watch how fast the leading syrup runs. Actually, Mrs. Butterworth is twice as thick as the other syrup. Mmm, yes. I never thought of that. I did. That sounds... So <laughs> that the was... real heist is who stole the actual pronunciation from that clip. <laughs> okay. Huh? Dun, dun, dun. Because it you was can muffled deci- and hard to understand. If you can decipher what you just heard. Oh. <laughs> I could. You couldn't? Yeah. It's like the crypto currency. Mrs. Scandal. Butterworth was just talking about how her syrups is twice as thick. thick. Yeah. twice as thick. It's a thick, it's... thick bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, uh, maybe it'll come across better in the show. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> she just moves on. The great Canadian maple syrup heist. Uh, I decided I wanted to talk about this because you talked about Canadian cryptocurrency uh, scandal, theft, scandal, whatever. I really and thought we were going to go three for three uh, on this once you came on board, but... And so I remember. Always, that, so sorry, always that one guy. <laughs> so sorry to ruin it. <laughs> and I remembered that I had previously seen a documentary on Netflix. Um, it's called Dirty Money, and they have like five episodes. And one of the episodes, six episodes, six episodes. How one of dare them, you, Alan, to think that there is only five when there is six? <laughs> but the Canadian syrup heist happened yeah. to be episode five. Oh, is it? Yeah. All right. Just <laughs> just thought you guys would like to know. Maybe I remember watching. Want to find it? So I remember watching this documentary and just like in my head at first, just kind of like laughing and just like, what is this like a joke or is this real? And it just like seemed so comical to me that it's maple syrup. That's 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 being heisted and this is like a big deal. There's in a Canada? documentary going on. Syrup is as good as money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I don't have any dollars. Do you take syrup? Yes, yes we do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently this was the biggest heist um, in all of Canadian history. Is that what you yeah. remember? The largest financial heist. Yeah. Um, so me and Danny, we both watched this doc. You do watch it. You watched it, right? Me? Well, yeah. Is um, your name Danny? <laughs> <laughs> I thought he just knew because he said me and Danny watched it, even though wouldn't the proper English be Danny and I? Oh my goodness. Or, yeah. I'm about to slap <laughs> you across the face. <laughs> but no, for real. Um, yeah, I did. Did you watch it? <laughs> that was the longest. It was a simple question and it took like 30 seconds to get the answer. <sighs> no, did I you? did not watch it. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> All right. So, 
um, basically 3,000 tons were stolen of maple syrup. In uh, 2011, 2012, over the course of a year, which is like 9,677 barrels. And how much, are, how much is, is it worth per barrel of maple syrup? It's $1,800 per barrel at the time that the documentary that we watched was recorded. Um, knowing it's a commodity, it could have changed slightly, but I would imagine it's still somewhat close to that. So and how many barrels were stolen? Uh, nine thousand, about nine thousand. If my if I do the math right, because I just hear three thousand tons, but then I looked up like how much maple syrup weighs per. Oh, so it didn't actually happen. Whatever. Okay. So I did the math, and it's about nine thousand six hundred seventy-seven barrels. Okay. Oh, I think they actually said that in the documentary too. They said nine thousand six hundred seventy-seven. Oh, did they? Or something. Well, really then your close math is really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's really your, close. Your Googling that. skills are superb. It was almost well, ten thousand. Um, so yeah, and I mean to get into it too a little bit. So maybe a good place to start, Al, would be like so. Well, Andy, by comparison, oil per barrel is today is about sixty dollars per barrel, and this is eighteen hundred dollars per barrel. Yeah, it's so way we're talking, more lucrative than yeah. oil. It's worth. We're a talking lot more. getting a lot of bang for your barrel. <laughs> so obviously I termed it as in maple syrup is basically the oil of Canada but it's even <laughs> more valuable <laughs> but um, and they even have so I mean maple syrup is literally treated like oil uh, like Alan said it's worth $1,800 a barrel and they actually have these what Trav? I'm just I kn- <laughs> I don't know. I just, I'm just thinking <laughs> how many pancakes they're eating. But <laughs> I know it's expensive. I, I know they're not just keeping the syrup in Canada. I mean, it's being exported and yes. people are buying it. But just the way that we're talking about it, it's just like just people go into the, go into the gas station. <laughs> but instead of filling up their car with, with gas, they fill up their bottle. They're just filling up their bottle, their water bottle. <laughs> With just thick freaking syrup. <laughs> and they say, and they say you, the U.S. is overweight. I mean, can you imagine? Like, if that's all they were consuming. <laughs> They're like Buddy the Elf. <laughs> Four main group, food groups. Candy. Candy <laughs> cane. Corn. Candy <laughs> corns. And it's, syrup. You like sugar. Is there sugar in syrup? Yes. Then Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> uh but yeah so um even to the point where they there's a, a federation called the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers in Canada yeah which when i looked it up it gave me an acronym of FPAC and i was like Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers doesn't make FPAC and then i was like oh it's Quebec so in French, it's like Federation de Producteurs, <laughs> but it's different. Different. I'm sure words. that's how they say it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but basically, they're the OPEC of uh, of maple syrup. And for anyone, I mean, just thirty second synopsis on what OPEC is for anyone who doesn't know. Trav, do you know what OPEC is? No, oil okay. producer. <laughs> Something? So OPEC is basically a group of – it's a powerful group within the oil industry, although, side note, they're not as powerful as they used to be because the U.S. is producing a lot more oil than we used to, but that's a side note. So <laughs> – um, but OPEC for the longest time was able to control the price of oil because they could control the supply. Yeah. So depending on the demand, they could either pinch off the supply – and they could skyrocket the price of oil or they could release a bunch of oil and they could make the price of oil tank. And you'd wonder why would they want to make it tank? Well, that's because especially in the U S and other countries, it used to be a lot more expensive for us to produce a barrel of oil. So if you make it so that the price of oil is below <laughs> what we can produce it at, <laughs> then it puts why us out of business. <laughs> Seriously, for the for this quote unquote thirty seconds that he's been doing this, he's been pounding his fists together like the whole time. 
This is why we need a camera. I know. What is this? the hand gesture? <laughs> this, is, this is my universal it's OPEC like, side. <laughs> also, I have know. a question. Were you going to explain what OPEC was regardless of if I knew what it was? <laughs> yeah. So why did you ask me? <laughs> For those of you who don't know what OPEC is, Travis, do you know what OPEC is? No. Okay. So if I would have said yes, I still feel like you would have been like, all right, I'm still going to tell everybody. <laughs> I feel like my knowledge of it is regardless, you know, it's, it's irrelevant. <laughs> all right. You're tr- that's right. <laughs> I just didn't. I wanted to know if you knew what it was, and if you would like to give it. If you would like to explain what it was, no. <laughs> so. But yeah, but because of this, right? So you know how we have Fort Knox in yeah. the U.S. What do we store in Fort Knox? <laughs> gold money. Yeah, gold, gold. Right. So in Canada, they have these giant warehouses that are basically like the Fort Knoxes of Canada, but inside those, Alan, what is there? Gold <laughs> syrup, <laughs> golden yep. syrup, maple syrup, just barrels of maple syrup, thousands and thousands of barrels of maple syrup stacked from floor to ceiling in this these giant warehouses. They're just mm. storing maple syrup. So why do they do this? Well, they do it because of the whole control the supply, the supply. Yeah, the whole federation has basically said, all right, if you are a maple syrup producer. If you create more than our said quota of maple syrup, you send all the excess to us. We put it in these barrels and we store it, right? On the flip side, if you do not produce as much as the quota says, then we will come up with the extra amount of the shortcoming and sell it out of our warehouses. So basically... If you're a producer of maple syrup, then you are guaranteed to make a certain amount Always, because if there's a shortage, they'll use it out of the reserves. If there's an excess, they'll put it in the reserves to use it when they need it. Mm. Right? So, so yeah. you'll always say it was like $100,000 a year. You will always be getting that $100,000 a year. Yeah. But you're not going to get any more. Yep. But ever. they can control, like Alan said, like OPEC, they can control the supply of um, maple syrup. So... Because if it was a completely free market, then the market could hypothetically get flooded with maple syrup. If like a whole bunch of producers were like, well, let's just crank out a bunch of maple syrup this year. And then the price of maple syrup would go down. Mm. And then everyone would make less per barrel or ounce or however they make money, right? Okay. So there's over 7,300 producers that are part of this whole federation. I don't know how many producers total there are, so but it sounds like there's less. It seemed like there was less producers that were against the federation than that were kind of for the federation. Yeah. Um, at least that's what it seemed like it was hinted towards. But but yeah, so basically, but there are a few. There are some people that hate the federation, and there's some people that actually really like the federation because it provides stability in the marketplace, right? So, uh, although it's natural to want. To back the underdog is what how I feel. Like usually when I'm watching sports or something, I'm like, if I don't have an invested interest in the favorite, I usually like to cheer for the underdog. So initially my thought process was like, well, I'm gonna cheer for these guys that are like anti the Federation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go anti Federation maple syrup producers. <laughs> Because uh, I was like taking it as in like, oh, well, that's the big bad wolf or something. That's like the big brother. And they're trying to fight back because they want a free market. But in the end, to me, and maybe it's because of the way that my brain works, but I think I would be on the side of the Federation. Like it would it make the process makes more sense to me. But I don't know, Alan, you watched the the documentary. What did you think? Like were you – did you understand – fully what the anti-federation producers were fighting for or wanted well they don't want some government agency telling them how much maple syrup they can produce or sell and to who and when like they just want to be their own maple syrup producer living (laughs) free what do we want maple syrup (laughs) when do we want it now (laughs) how much do we want 
all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Who do we want to sell it to? Literally everybody. <laughs> Mostly America. <laughs> so, so, so they just, yeah, they want to, I mean, because if you produced a lot one year, then you can go sell all of that and make Two hundred thousand dollars versus a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Right. So more. So or it's less, like you're saying like it's if like I put if in these other guys are work, can't produce as much as me. Like why am I gonna not get my two hundred thousand dollars and they're gonna get a guaranteed hundred thousand dollars? You know, if I'm working more and producing more, that's not fair. Yeah. Well, no, and that's true. That does make sense. Um. And I guess if I was actually in the industry, I look at it more of like a, hey, it's just nice to have this like steady maple syrup price because they show that the price of maple syrup once the federation was <laughs> <laughs> was implemented um, rose steadily, and now maple syrup is selling at all time highs, right? And so, to a certain degree, it's like, okay, would I rather have maple syrup selling at three times the value that it was at, and then I don't have to produce as much to make as much money? But I could also see, like, I just really want to put in some overtime this year and make an yeah, extra like, 20 grand. But if you flood the market, I mean, any one producer, it makes sense to do. Like, I would love to be the only producer that's like, I can sell as much maple syrup into the market as I want as long as everyone else is controlled by the federation because that would keep the price high and I could get my raise but it would be better for us maple syrup consumers because it'd be cheaper <laughs> alright so I have a question yes what is the Canadian maple syrup <laughs> heist <laughs> oh yeah let's get to that part of it <laughs> Oh, you want to know that, Trav? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give a crap about the market. I want to know who's still in the syrup. <laughs> All right. So to get into that, um, Alan had tasked me with the, the job of making sure that I could find the actual names of these people um, so we can go into it. But basically, the story is there was a four-man operation for the most part uh, that all were able to get together and still all this syrup yeah basically we had we just went through all of that probably in excess to explain why they have giant warehouses full of barrels and barrels of maple yeah. syrup i feel so <laughs> i feel like we could have just started and just been like all right so there are like these warehouses filled with syrup okay <laughs> that's where we start that's where we start <laughs> <laughs> so Oh, uh, but yeah, so this guy, Avik Korong, uh, who also apparently had connections to the mafia, uh, his spouse uh, owned this warehouse. I don't know if she owned it and he bought it and like just put it under her name or, or what, or if she really just owned it herself. I don't know. But that's regard, or that's ir- not irregardless. That's regardless. Regardless of that information. Um, she owned a. Uh, a warehouse in which they stored a bunch of these barrels of syrup, right? One of those giant warehouses that Mm -hmm. we were talking about. So now that he had an in at the warehouse, he was able to say like, look, I, I could take some of these barrels and, steal them and basically no one would be the wiser because I'm the one that's basically running this. Only he's not like, he's not actually taking the barrels. He's emptying the barrels of their contents and then refilling them with water. <laughs> He's like just taking them out and put it in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's how uh, I learned. I earned my name Sticky Pockets. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Sticky Fingers. <laughs> no, uh, not to be confused with the Sticky Bandits from <laughs> Home Alone Two. So in New York. yeah, so basically this they should have called themselves that the well, Sticky Bandits. They're still in syrup. They should be called the Sticky <laughs> Bandits. <laughs> I know the writing was up. on the wall. It was yeah. there. The but maybe Home Alone sh- wasn't big in Canada. Doesn't matter. It still would have been awesome. Yeah, so you might have you might have no- noticed that earlier I said in 2011-2012 over the course of a year 3000 tons of maple syrup were heisted. So this solely. is basically And it's because yeah, they were he was they were emptying barrels and then refilling them with water. Mm, it's kind of like a Shawshank Redemption type thing. So what they were so, doing is this Avik Koron would allow them to, to get the barrels. They would put them into a truck 
and then they would take the truck somewhere. They would then siphon out the syrup and then refill the barrels with water. <laughs> how slow would that take? <laughs> <laughs> how yeah? How hard would you have to suck on that tube? <laughs> And then they would refill them with water, and then they would... They're like, thank God this isn't Mrs. Butterworth. (laughs) It's twice as thick. (laughs) And they would put it back uh, in the warehouse. And then this occurred, like Alan said, over the course of a year. Uh, Well, it's great and all to be able to steal the syrup, but if once you steal the syrup, you need somebody to move the syrup, right? So there's a guy named Sebastian... uh, I don't know. It's J U T R A S, but in Canada, I don't know if like the J would be silent or if you would say it. Jutras, what? But what I, if, why? Would, I really think he's French though, because it's in Quebec. Yeah. What do so, they call those uh, coyotes or whatever? The people that smuggle. Uh, yeah, those? coyotes. The hyenas. <laughs> Are I we thought... just naming animals? <laughs> <laughs> Finish my sentence and you'll know what I'm talking about. What are those things called? Coyotes? Hyenas. Coyotes, yeah. Hyenas. They smuggle people across the border. Yeah. Or, so they have like a or, like a syrup coyote? Yes. Yeah, that's basically but this guy, his, his <laughs> job, hyena. His job was <laughs> to transport <laughs> the syrup. By the way, Coyotes aren't out in the Serengeti. <laughs> they would die immediately. You know, small coyote. I don't know why, to... but I really thought Trav's train of thought was like, what are those like? Coy- but like the ones that live in Africa. He's, tr- he's trying to like finish my thought for me. <laughs> what are those? Trav is definitely Africa talking about hyenas. <laughs> 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 All right, back to this heist. So Sebastian, we'll call him, is the one that's transporting the syrup and transporting it where? Well, he's transporting it to a Richard Valeris. Um, he was the one that would be able to sell the syrup on the black market. Okay, so now you got yeah, the so person. There's a black market of syrup now. <laughs> so now you got a person who is the uh, original, like, st- Stealer, I guess the guy stealing it out of his own thief. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're struggling. What is today. this? <laughs> I'm super tired because I work freaking five, twelve hour shifts this week. So, and I just have a family. <laughs> um, Sebastian is the one transporting it. They're getting it to Richard, and he's selling it on the black market. And then on the black, or uh, ultimately, it gets to a guy named Etienne Saint Pierre, who is a reseller of syrup that he's now getting it. He's selling it all over the world. Oh. So in the end. They moved all the syrup, which netted them over eighteen million dollars over the course well, of this year. So, because th- is it in the province of Quebec? Yes. Is it Quebec or Quebec? I, I think I think it's, it's Quebec. Quebec but. but in the province of Quebec, it's illegal to sell syrup like to the black market and stuff like that. But yeah. but in the other provinces, it's not like they don't follow the federation. I don't think so. They, if they can get it out, of they can Quebec, get it out of Quebec. And then they could sell it wherever. Oh, the black, on the black market, market place where you can find eyeballs for, and also just illegally exported syrup. syrup. <laughs> so, just, just <laughs> organs, just different human <laughs> organs and syrup. Uh, Do you know what though? That would have been like a fun brand if you like literally were at the store and there's like a black market syrup brand black yeah. market syrup like ooh it's that good vape. stuff it's three times as thick <laughs> as the regular syrup <laughs> this is pure this isn't the watered down crap but yeah so I mean I didn't have anything else really on so um, what happened I mean did they catch him oh yeah we probably should say that huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did. So they they caught the the. I heard the. So the mastermind behind it, he got I think eight years in yeah. prison and like a eight, ten, twelve million dollar fine, something like that. Which I don't know how was he going to pay that. That was like Richard how do you pay a fine Valeris. like that while you're in prison? Yeah, uh, Avi Caron ended up with like five years in prison mm-hmm. and. A couple hundred thousand dollars in fines or something like that. Sebastian seemed like he didn't even go to prison. I think he was just like on house arrest or something. <laughs> They're like, so what are you in for? I sold. I don't know why he's rushing. <laughs> I sold 
shitload of syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Sebastian is the one that transported it. He, oh. I drove. <laughs> I drove. You, shitload of syrup. <laughs> really far. <laughs> like, so what if you were a milkman? <laughs> it's a crime now? It's not illegal to sell milk in Canada. <laughs> But syrup is different to question. But part of the part of like the for the forensics of how they noticed that some of these barrels, like because they were refilling them, so you, you wouldn't really notice until you opened them. But somebody started noticing that the barrels were like the rusting. Weight? Oh, okay. Like they were some of the barrels, not all of, but they were starting yeah, to develop rust on to, them and so They were like they were like metal. Yeah, yeah, corrode yeah. and bleed. Wouldn't you're Syrup have well, like an iron taste. So the thing is, if it's maple syrup, it doesn't corrode at all. It doesn't start rusting. It doesn't do any of that damage that water will do to to the metal on the barrels. So that's how they noticed what's going. Why are these barrels rusting? They shouldn't be doing that with syrup. And then they realize, oh, some of these are filled with water. What's going on here? Hmm. So they uh, brought in the Canadian investigation i don't want like there were the cops basically but there's over 250 of them that were assigned to this case and they went in and they had to go through like every single barrel and see which ones had syrup and which ones had water we're calling all guys on this one eh? <laughs> i mean this is the biggest crime <laughs> it was ever, that's eh? what they say <laughs> in canadian uh, history we need all hands on deck eh? <laughs> all of the syrup <laughs> oh geez we have a major, <laughs> a major syrup shortage. <laughs> okay, you just get voices. Quick, call me myself. <laughs> and <What>? I read <laughs> the uh, Jim Carrey oh, movie. Uh, myself, me, Harry. myself, and Irene. But he would just be call me myself because he's a cop, right? Canadian cop. So that is the uh, Canadian syrup heist. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks so you if you can, okay, one more time. Uh, if you want to see that, check it out on you know, see Netflix. What was the the show? Show is Dirty Money, Dirty and Money. I guess it's episode five. Okay. It's the out of six, out of six, yeah. six, out of six. Right? I'm sorry, I messed that up so earlier. Scroll down past one through four. <laughs> Stop. Okay. If you got to six, you went too far. All right. Well, let's get to mine. Here we go. What's your question, Trav? Well, we'll tell you. It's what would who would you bring back? You want to know how I got these scars? My father was a drinker and a fiend. And one night, he goes off crazier than usual. Mommy gets the kitchen knife to defend herself. He doesn't like that. Not one bit. So, me watching, he takes the knife to her. This is so Left suspenseful. I know. He turns to me. And he says, why so serious? He comes at me with the knife. Why so serious? He sticks the blade in my mouth. Let's put a smile on that face. All right. It's that, like I, we were talking about it earlier, it's that. Yeah. Just that. In the background. Music in the back that is it just, just suspenseful. So, yes, my question is, who would you bring back? You can probably, I mean, make a guess uh, with, with that clip. Um, this is something that I... It's, Christian Bale. It's weird that I think about this quite often. I don't know. I, just, he, kept, I just kept moving. <laughs> I just, just kept ignored me. <laughs> it's like Danny has just Tourette's sometimes. Hyena. Yeah. Christian Bale. Christopher <laughs> Nolan. But I think like with celebrities um, of, of, you know, all across the board, we're talking movie stars, TV stars, athletes, musicians, you know, these people are in our lives from, you know, from early on or whatever, you know, there are actors and actresses that we have grown up with and, mm -hmm. you know, they're our favorite. And all of a sudden one day they're just gone. And it sucks <laughs> because, like, you enjoyed, like, everything that they were able to do so much that all of a sudden when it's not there, it does. It feels like there's something 
missing from your life. And yeah. uh, I mean, to a certain extent, especially with <clears throat> people like that, I think it's you feel like you knew them almost. Yeah. So when they when they die, because you see so much of them, um, if especially like they're an actor or a musician or something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, so I mean, I've I've, I've had this thought before because I have like a CNN app or and like multiple news apps on my phone, and like every month it seems like they'll like name like a few old famous people that died that are like died at 70 something and mm-hmm. 80 whatever and i have no idea who these people are but i know that that older generation they grew up with them so i'm like how would it feel to just like all these people that were famous when you were growing up are now all just dropping mm-hmm. like flies because, I mean, it happens once in a blue moon to people that are, like, our age yeah. that are super famous, but, yeah. we're I mean, we're seeing that, and, and uh, you know, I think it was, like, a few years ago. Like, 2016 was, like, a horrible year for, like, I remember just every so often hearing another celebrity die that I was like, man, like, I really like those people. <laughs> and, uh, but, anyway, so, because of this, and it's a thought that I have, you know, quite often, I, I often think, I'm like, you know, could let's say I could go back in time and for whatever reason <laughs> I'm like I want to save one. If I could turn <laughs> back in time, who would I save? You know, and I before we get on with this topic, I want everybody to know that because I have created a list, a top five list, and an honorable mentions. Now I feel like that is very <laughs> like <laughs> I don't know what the word is, but this is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that these people deserve to live over everybody else. <laughs> I'm just saying these are the people that were in that that the, I like, followed the most that most. were inf- influencers or when I heard of their deaths that I was like mostly uh quote unquote affected by, you know. Mm. And so um I put that together, but just so you know, I'm not trying to be insensitive. Uh, it, these are just people that I really enjoyed following their career and uh you know, now that they're gone, it sucks. Um, and, uh, you know, as we get to the end here, I'd like to, to hear, you know, your guys' thoughts. I mean, not just Danny and Alan here, but, uh, you out there and, uh, in podcast listening world, <laughs> <laughs> wherever you may be, Q coders, um, through one of our yeah, various channels if, that you can get in touch with us in. If, uh, I don't mention any of the ones that you uh, are thinking of, then please let us know because there are so many. In fact, as I was going through this, I was like, oh my gosh, there, I, I don't think I can just make a top five. I forced myself to. But uh, yeah. so what we're going to do um, here is I'm going to go through and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give mine because there might be ones, because I asked you guys to give me like a top three or top five or something like that. And uh, so some of them might overlap. So that way we don't have to like talk about things yeah, twice. Times. So, yeah. um, and then also the one kind of idea that I had was, I guess, rule for the the individual. And there isn't a definitive line here, but you know, if somebody just died because they were just old and died of natural causes, you know, I didn't necessarily consider that because, like, what are you going to do? Go back in time and be like, "Don't get older. <laughs> you will die." <laughs> When you are old. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I feel like... So that was just kind of the and way I thought when I was looking at some of Keanu these. Reeves. Yeah, yes, that's that what I was kind of thinking it. of, like, Bill and Ted. Uh, it's like, oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you get old... I don't know why he's British now. <laughs> if you get old, you will die. <laughs> Unless you know Kung Fu. <laughs> but, uh, so, so here is all, uh, here's my top five. I'll start with number five and move my way down to number one. Oh, All right. Top five All right. list. So, uh, number five, Michael Jackson. Um, you guys are aware of this. I mean, I think you guys kind of like grew up with me in this and the fact that we were pretty big Michael Jackson fans. Yeah. That was the first was CD the, I ever that's had. That's what I was going to say. You was his history album. Yeah. Um, he was the king of pop. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy surrounding Michael Jackson and uh, his possible, you know, off work activities. <laughs> so maybe what you could do is you could go back in time and you could say, hey, Michael, 
<laughs> Guess what? Like, I know that you're you're gonna die in X amount of years from it was a drug overdose. So he OD'd yeah. on uh, pro- uh, propofol, propofol, and uh, benzodiazepine. Yeah. So you need to lay off the prescription drugs. But the thing. Well, okay, continue with what you're saying. It's not before, even a prescription drug, though. But before I tell you which drugs to lay off of, you need to promise me one thing. Yes. You need to <laughs> promise me that you will not hang out with little boys. Okay. That's what so I guess. Then you can do I'm not two getting, for one. <laughs> I'm not getting into that. I'm really talking about is I remember the first, uh, my first early memory of just listening to music in the car was uh, we were riding in, I think it was uh, this Hyundai, this red Hyundai that we had, and uh, my mom popped in the Thriller. I, no, it was actually the, uh, oh. Beat it. The Dangerous. Oh. Dangerous uh, album. Dangerous. Uh, but it was, you know, the, the tape, and I just thought it was so amazing. And from there on, I bought all of his tapes and then CDs. And then, you know, they came out with special editions and I rebought those and, <laughs> and uh, just everything, you know. And we've made, mu- we've made music videos and <laughs> just, ah. So, yeah, he, to say that he was a part of my life is an understatement, you know. And, uh, but he died on June 25th, 2009. He was 50 years old and, yes, uh, died on uh, propofol and benzodiazepine as a uh, – but they're, they're not necessarily prescriptions, but his, his uh, physician was giving him those. Yeah. And uh, that's the whole, uh, I guess, controversy behind it is because he should have known that uh, what he was giving him was too much. Yeah, and, and propofol – from what I've gathered working at ER, prof- prof- propofol, you do not leave the patient when you give them. Like, yeah. You have the doctor has to be there the whole time, and you're not supposed to. I don't just be using it for sleep. To mm-hmm. that's the wrong use. What we use it for in the ER is when somebody comes in with the uh, AFib heart rate or heart rhythm, so it's like not a regular heart rate rhythm. We have to, we give them propofol to like basically consciously sedate them to where they're just like completely out of it. And then we put like electrodes on their chest and then we shock their heart back into a regular beat. Yeah. So is it called propofol? And then you immediately give them a dr- another drug that counteracts the propofol. Are you going to say a joke? Well, so- I was just wondering if it's, <laughs> if it's propofol because you need, to, you need to have a pro there before they fall. Propofol. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, and the thing that was Could sad be. about it is, obviously, I mean, he was 50. He had already had his his big career, right? And uh, he was just kind of, wasn't really doing a lot uh, between, you know, probably his, I mean, he came out with that Invincible album in like 2000 and like. Oh, like uh, the newer, yeah. like the, one of his later ones? What was his, the what was big single recent? on that one? Um, it was Damn. actually. No. No. It was, it was that, actually pretty that good. Was, like, dangerous. I can sing it in my head, but I yeah. yeah, I don't can't remember it at the moment. But anyway, so um but he was he was in the middle of rehearsing for this big comeback uh, this, tour. This big comeback tour. And uh then yeah, I guess it was just a lot. I mean, I, I didn't realize he was doing a comeback tour. Oh, yeah. So we so we could have had this like huge Michael Jackson comeback. So there is a uh, documentary, it was on Netflix, but it's about it's called This Is It. And uh, it's all about his his tour that he was preparing for before he died. Oh. Yeah. So um, anyway, and so, so and because because Michael Jackson was on my list too. So since you're already talking about it, but yeah, I just remember growing up, and we might have talked about this before, but we would go to the library and we would rent videos from the library when we were kids. And there was two videos that we would always actively try to get. Alan always wanted to get um, what was it called? The one with the Dorothy. <laughs> Wizard of Oz. Wiz- <laughs> <laughs> My I always, I always forget the name of that How? One. I don't know. <laughs> I remember <laughs> all the characters. I just can never remember the name of the movie <laughs> for some reason. It's just there's a blank spot in the head. That is amazing. <laughs> but then the other one was Moonwalker. Oh yeah, and that's our what I was gonna favorite yeah. song on there. Like we, I don't smooth even know. Yeah, criminal. Yeah, smooth watched criminal, it so yeah. many times. A smooth criminal, 
to the point where I almost probably broke my shins many times because I was trying to lean so far <laughs> <laughs> without falling over. And just and say, like, Danny's leaning again <laughs> excessively. <laughs> every, no every time I see a cue ball, <laughs> I, I wish I could just, like, just smash it. it to powder in my hand and <laughs> blow it in someone's face. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, Michael Jackson was a big... And I actually had him further up the list, um, but then, I don't know, I guess just because of how his career was and everything, I, again, he didn't deserve to die, but, uh, you know, he, he did a lot. Yeah. And uh, by the time, I mean, by the time he was 50, he did more than, I mean, anybody could have ever imagined or anything. So... It's kind of started so early, yeah. too. That is true. So, uh, he was my number five. Number four... Is Bill Paxton? Oh, he's dead. Alan, the <laughs> Twister guy. Yes, he's been dead since two thousand. Since uh, he died on April twenty fifth, two thousand seventeen. He was sixty one years old. Oh. Um, and uh, but he he died of a stroke during surgery to repair a heart valve and aorta. So this one kind of is borderline because I mean he he was. So, I'm not going to say he was elderly because you look at him, you're like, there's no way. Yeah. Like the dude doesn't look like he's 61. He looks like he's 40. Yeah. So. Like he did so much in his career. Um, but yeah, he just went in for a surgery to, to replace that and ended up having a stroke and, and passed. Um, but I mean, just some of the movies, just in case you're sitting there thinking like what? Bill Paxton, Alan already gave one away. The twister guy. In fact, I was talking to the uh, to my coworker at work, and I said, because I was telling him about this, and I said, I'm thinking I'm going to put Bill Paxton on there. And he's like, who? I mean, he is 25, so he's of the younger generation who are probably like, Bill Paxton, what? <laughs> but I did say, I'm like, dude, the guy on True Lies. Uh, the, and he's like, oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, but Twister, yes. Uh, I remember him originally from Weird Science, if you guys are, what? Uh, do you guys remember Weird Science? Oh, is that where they, where they like, make bring a woman, a woman to they, life yeah, or something? They like make that? the like, ideal woman. Yeah, and uh, he's one of their, uh, he's one of the main kids, like older brothers. Oh, I mean, he ends up getting turned into this like pile of sludge. Like at the end, I don't know. So <laughs> I'm funny. not to rewatch that one's. I haven't seen Bill Pax. Long time. Freaking amazing. Um, aliens. Freaking aliens. Like the original? No. So there's alien. Oh, and then number two. Number two. Aliens. Aliens. He's one of the soldiers there. It and yeah. Uh he was great. And I mean, I love the aliens yeah. series. So uh True Lies, Apollo 13. Which Predator vs. Alien is not no part of that. No same they are series. Not. They that are one not. sucks and it's not worth watching. Actually, as well, far they as they are I'm, part of the same universe. They no, technically they, are, yes, oh, but no. uh, I keep them separate. But uh, so yeah, Apollo thirteen. But no, that amazing. whole movie was not part. That's not anything part like Prometheus and the original Alien movies. I heard it's like just some offshoot movie that no, they brought together. them together later. Yeah. Did they? But, yeah, Predator and Aliens are in the same universe. Like they, their stories cross. Yeah. No, I'm saying that movie. It like you know how you have Batman with. Christian Bale, Dark Knights, and then you have like a whole nother stream of Batman. Or you have Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man, and then you have the new Spider-Man. Yeah. They're not... Alan, just because you don't you? like it, you can't just take it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I get what you're saying. It's not like, oh, this is Alien, Aliens, <laughs> Alien 3, and then you have Alien vs. Predator. No. They're not part of the same batch of Alien <laughs> yes, movies, yes. I'm saying. <laughs> we get it. Okay, they're, they're, yeah. not, it's not in the same timeline. So, but <laughs> but they still cross. They still cross. Um, <laughs> I get it. I get what you're saying. Um, Apollo 13. We'll say it for the fifth time. Uh, Edge of Tomorrow. U571, which is a great submarine movie. If you guys haven't seen it, um, and then he was also the director of one of my favorite sports movies of all time, which is the greatest game ever played with Shia LaBeouf. It's about golf, but uh, <laughs> I've never yeah. seen that. Yeah, it's a good one. It all, every time I watch it, I would just want to go golfing. So, but uh, so yeah, he he did a lot. I and just whenever when I heard that he was gone, I was like, man, like because he was never like that guy that was always that was the lead. Really, I mean, Twister, yes, but everything else, he was pretty much like just a side character. But I think he made it so much better anytime that he was in it. Yeah. 
So that's my number four, Bill Paxton. Uh, and I also had a tie for number four <laughs> because I just could not decide between these two guys. So you really have a top six. I do have a top okay. six, but these guys are on the same platform in my mind. And uh, somebody, I feel like I'm going to say this and you guys are going to be like, who? But Brad Renfro. Yeah. Yeah. That a, guy. No clue who he is. <laughs> uh, okay. The one movie that I think you guys would probably know him from is a Disney movie called Huck and Finn. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. That guy. You don't know. Don't know. <laughs> the bum? No, he's Huckleberry. He's Tom, or he's, yeah, Huck. <laughs> oh, he's Huck. Huck. But anyway. All right, I'm it, looking him up right now so I can see if I. <laughs> so Brad Renfro was just in a bunch of movies that I enjoyed at a younger age. Um, but see, he came out um, hitting it, I guess, as far as like movies went, he started strong. I mean, he was a young child actor, and his first movie um, was The Client with Tommy Lee Jones and Susan Sarandon. And it's basically this, uh, and I, I feel like I've, I've act, I feel like I've seen it, but I, at the top of my head, cannot remember a lot about it because it's been so long. Mm. But I know that uh, he basically witnesses like this murder of this mob boss or something, and so then he hires Tommy Lee Jones to basically protect him. Um, but anyway, so but he came out, and everybody was like, when when he was, you know, this portrayed this character, it was like this kid's amazing. And he came out and did some other pretty cool things. Um, uh, hold on. Just so was he big in the 90s? 90s, yeah. Okay. Um, he died on January 15th, 2008, but really didn't do a whole lot after the 90s. Um, so he was in The Client with Tommy Lee Jones and Susan Sarandon. He was in a movie called The Cure um, where it's him and the kid from, from Jurassic Park, um, oh, Joseph yeah. Mozello. Um, and uh, Joseph Mazzello's character has cancer, and so they just become best friends, and they just go on this journey to find the cure for cancer. Mm. Um, it's a good movie. Uh, so what did he die of? Brad oh, uh, he died of a heroin overdose. Okay. Um, he was in Tom and Huck with uh, Jonathan, T- Jonathan Taylor Thomas. And then uh, one of the probably more powerful uh, movies that he was in, I mean, in my opinion, was Apt Pupil, which was with Ian McClellan. Um, Gandalf. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> sir. You have we to add the need, sir, Sir Ian McClellan. Um, and it's basically uh, their neighbors, and uh, he kind of starts spending some time with with them. Uh, Br- Brad Renfro spends a lot of time with Ian McClellan. Co- ah, that's a lot of Ian McClellan. McClellan. His character and starts realizing that he may be like one of those like escaped Nazi like generals. Oh. And uh, so he then starts to blackmail him. Like and, SS. Yeah, like one of those dudes. And it was, I remember watching that movie and I was like, man, this is kind of deep. <laughs> but he was so young in that. I mean, he died at the age of uh, 25. So, but anyway, that was tied with number four. So Brad Renfro. Um, number three, Robin Williams. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> feel like I could spend a lot of time talking about Robin Williams. So he died on uh, August 11th, 2014. He was 63 years old. Dies of, he died of asphyxia due to hanging. So yeah. we know that uh, he, he killed, killed himself. Because um, wasn't he, he was super diagnosed with uh, oh, yeah, Parkinson's he, right before yeah, that? Yeah, diagnosed like that. with Parkinson's. Had a, I mean, throughout his life, uh, was living with uh, major depression. Yeah. And, uh, and which is the thing. It's like what we're learning is that like – the people who are killing themselves because of this, you know, disorder or however you want to label it, mm-hmm. like everybody's like, yeah, we, I would have never known. And uh, because, I mean, look at him. He was a comedian. Yeah. He's making people laugh. So shouldn't he be happy, right? But uh, so obviously we know that that was a tragic ending. Um, he obviously began as a comedian, but there was so much more to him and his talent. I mean, <laughs> I loved him in Hook. His voice talents in various movies, but he was, of course, a la- or he was the Aladdin. genie in Aladdin. Uh, Jack, that movie uh. with him <laughs> as a kid, but he's like looked like he was forty years old. So, speaking of like kind of Hook. His depression, um, and Trav named Hook. I oh, think you did. Yeah. That was the first one, but um, Jack. What was the one? <laughs> what was the one movie though that was like a 
something like about pictures or photographs. So one hour photo. That yeah. I also have that in Wasn't here. Wasn't that like where he was supposed to be like super? Well, so that was the thing. Like song, as you yeah. as I'm reading these, you kind of see the di- the range of his talent. So like he went like as you know as simple as like little kid movies he was just you know he was yeah. the voice actor he d- he uh vo- did some stuff for disney um and then i think s- maybe dreamworks i can't remember what robots came from that movie robots wow. anyway but he was a voice actor for that um did mrs doubtfire jumanji which is amazing uh and then from there it kind of got a little bit more into the dramatic stuff um Goodwill. which was like goodwill hunting patch adams but then went into thrillers like one hour photo and insomnia Mm -hmm. and just it was all over the place meanwhile he's going and and guest starring on whose line is it anyway with drew carey and he does he what yeah i never saw him on that yeah so i mean was wasn't he in toys toys yeah i mean i only named just a few i mean there were so many i think over a hundred films that he starred in. Something about a bird cage. It's called Bird Cage. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. But anyway, it's just super sad what happened to him. Although he was sixty one years old, I mean I still consider him I mean he ended his life. Yeah. Who knows how much more he he could have had to and whether it was acting or doing whatever for everybody else or just for himself, you know, just he had a lot left in the tank. So um, so that was my number three. My number two, Walter Payton. So if you know me, you know I am a huge Bears fan, but I feel like this transcends just Bears fandom. <laughs> um, just if you are a fan of football, you know who Walter Payton was and you know what he did. Um, but yeah, he died November 1st, 1999. He died of a liver disease known as uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, which eventually led to something called, and now I'm going to see if I can say this, uh, colon, <laughs> cholangiocarcinoma, which is bile duct cancer. That I don't know what that is, but it sounds horrible. <laughs> what year did he retire? I, see, they won the see, 85. I think he was like 86. 87, 88, because okay. I don't think he was... So he was it. like a solid decade out of the league before he passed away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I remember, I mean, I was in high school when, or we were in high school when he passed. I remember my dad told me, and then the next day I wore a Walter Payton jersey to school. And um, for whatever reason, I thought that nobody would know like what I was doing, <laughs> but I got so many comments and I guess compliments are like, yeah, man, Walter Payton, you. I was like, man, I thought I was the only one who knew who this guy was. <laughs> but uh, so obviously you're not wanting to bring him back because his football career was short. No, he, he was, was just, just, I mean, he had his own issues. I mean, if you've watched the documentary on him that uh, uh, NFL films uh, did, I mean, obviously he wasn't, he didn't have the perfect life, um, had some issues in his marriage and things like that, but he was a good person. He was doing some good stuff for other people. Um, and you know, it, the story of it is sad. I mean, if you guys have seen the movie or heard of the movie, Brian song, have you? Oh my good heavens. Who are Brian's you? song? Brian song about Brian Piccolo. He's one of the bears. Uh, he was a, fullback for them back in the days of gail sayers you know who gail sayers is daniel (laughs) are you lying move on good heavens do you guys not know football history you just look at what's what's happening now yeah so gail sayers is a hall of famer like huge no name (laughs) in nfl history uh, one of the greatest running backs of all time. Um, and what team did he play for? Better Gale Sayers? Than yeah. The Bears. Better uh, than Saquon Barkley? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, so Brian's song is a, uh, is a very well-known movie, and it's about Brian Piccolo, who, like I said, was this Bears running back. Him and uh, Gale Sayers developed this really good relationship, like this brotherly relationship. Because back then, this was when uh, you know black people coming into sports 
like professional sports were still kind of like it was a new thing. Not necessarily new, but still they were still looked at as like the lesser. Yeah. You know, it's like oh, you're you're not the same color, whatever. So you know, coming in dealing with all that, but Brian Piccolo is white, Gail Sayers black, um, and they just developed this friendship and ends up Brian Piccolo gets cancer, like pretty nasty cancer to where he kept having to go into different, to all these different surgeries and getting parts of him like, like taken out um, until he just couldn't take out anymore uh, because the cancer kept spreading. And uh, it's a really beautiful story. I mean, (laughs) you watch the movie of like the top tear jerking movies of all time. That is one of them. So fast forward to the, to the nineties and you have this story with pretty much similar with, uh, Walter Payton and his backup, uh, fullback, which was, his name is Matt Suey. And, uh, right before Walter Payton died, he looked at Matt and he said, you know what? This is Brian's song too, except in this one, the brother dies. And, uh, so, and I mean, obviously his legacy lives on every year. They have a Walter Patton, Walter Patton, Walter Payton man of the year award. It goes out to the person on, uh, you know, each, each team nominates their own, their own person, uh, or their own teammate. Uh, and they are looked at as the people that are doing the most for their community mm-hmm. and the most good. And then of course the, uh, the NFL gets together and they, they choose the, the winner out of all 32. But anyway, so there's a lot that, that goes on uh, with him. And of course, that would just be great to still have him around and just to have his wisdom. I mean, even having him like uh, coaching or something. Yeah. Can you imagine? I mean, for the Vikings, though. No, that would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So we're down to my number one which I'm assuming you can guess. I think this is a lot of people's number one. I played the, the clip for you at the very beginning, and that would be Heath Ledger. He, who? No, who? Heath, Heath Ledger. Ledger. He died January 22nd, 2008. He was 28 years old. He died as a result of uh, acute intoxication by combined effects of oxycodone, hydrocodone, diazepam, tim- I can't say this one, temazepam, al. Prozolam <laughs> and doxil- doxilamine. Anyway, that's a lot of stuff to have in your system. Yeah. Um, Wait, so he was depressed too, right? He was depressed, but I think he was also overworked. He was doing a lot. Um, and then I feel like he was also under the weather. Uh, these are not all, I mean, a lot of these can be prescribed, but there are a couple of them, as I was reading about this, that are not so easily given. And so he probably picked them from somewhere else. Also, one of them may or may not be used for, you know, uh, it's kind of more like a, uh, I'm going to take this because, yeah, because I'm, I'm addicted to it. Not, yeah. I mean, I'm taking it not for my symptoms, but because I just want this drug. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, so there's a lot that goes into it. Basically, uh, about 3 p.m. Uh, on that day, he was discovered by um, his, his, uh, I think is maid or whatever cleaner and uh you know was rushed to the hospital but uh, they pretty much figured time of death was around one o'clock anyway so he had been dead for a couple hours but uh i mean movies i mean we'll just quickly get this out of was way, he so. involved with michelle williams I don't know about that i know that uh, his, his, there- his one of his best friends was mary kate olsen one of the twins. oh maybe that's who i was thinking of yeah the Olsen twins. Yeah. But uh, I obviously first, uh, most, or the movie that most people can remember him first being in here in the, because he's an Australian actor, but yeah. um, here in the tale. States, no, was actually 10 Things I Hate About You. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, then he moved on to The Patriot, which The Patriot, I like that. Such movie. a great movie. I remember he that. He was like the oldest brother. Right? Mel Gibson. Yeah. yeah. In that one. Uh, yep. And uh, then he went on to A Knight's Tale, which is also a very underrated movie movie i liked this it's pretty no, entertaining well, that's what i'm saying it's like it's just about a you know a poor kid who should be a knight but goes into a jousting contest i don't know it doesn't seem that great but you watch it and you're like this is amazing <laughs> like, i love this movie um and then after that uh, started to make a name for himself with other movies like monsters ball lords of dogtown which is that skateboarding movie and then came brokeback mountain which 
to this day, I have not seen. And it's not because I'm like, nah, you know, I don't want to see him and uh, Jake Gyllenhaal Mackin. But uh, <laughs> it's, I just haven't seen it. But, uh, you know, that obviously caused such a ruckus in mm-hmm. that, in the film community. <laughs> But, uh, and then from that point, uh, you know, with everything else, you know, leading up to that, he was able to score his role as the Joker in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, which we all know was amazing. And then he died soon after that. Um, was, was it like before it even was released, he died? He died before the movie was released, yeah. yes. But he had completed production. Yeah. Because he was actually already on another film, which was called The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. And in that movie, he died partway through. And if you, I suggest watching it because it's actually interesting how they do it. It was a really good movie in my opinion. Oh, so he's still in it? Like they didn't He's still in it, no. But what they else? did was they took his character and, and they took basically up to where he was and then kind of rewrote the end of the movie. Um, or, well, the other half of it. And his character, as he's going into this imaginarium, every time he goes in, is his person changes. Um, oh. And it's, he's replaced by other characters, like, um, like, crap, I think, like, Robert Downey Jr.'s in it. And, um, and what is this called? The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Mm. Um, it's, like I said, I thought it was a good movie. Um, let's see. There it is. So, other people that are in it uh, that are him. Is it, so, it's about, what is it even about? You know what? I can't remember. <laughs> but I just remember. Apparently, he goes like, into like an imaginary. Yeah. yeah. I just remember enjoying it. So, but yeah, other people, uh, I couldn't find it at the moment, but I remember, you know, other like highly well known characters, or Johnny Depp, I think, is in it too. And they are him. And so oh. they go in and they just play these parts that he was supposed to play. And it just... It works. It just works. So I suggest I suggest watching it. But all right. So that is my top five. Sorry, I'm opening up my computer here. And uh, I'm not going to go into any more. Of, I just want to read the names that were on my honorable mention yeah. list, uh, which were like Chris Farley, Tom Petty from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Paul Walker, uh, Brittany Murphy, Carrie Fisher. I forgot about Br- Brittany Murphy. Yeah. Um, Prince, uh, River Phoenix, which is Joaquin Phoenix's oh, yeah. older brother. He was in uh, Indiana Jones. Yep. He was young uh, Indiana Jones. Yeah. Yep. Um, Jonathan Brandis, who is, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of one that you guys would know him from because I know you have no clue who he is. <laughs> um, Alan Rickman. He died? Oh, yeah, he did. Yeah. So. Those are kind of my... Are they all... I mean, a lot of those names I know, but like, are the ones that we don't know all actors? Mm. Uh, Jonathan Brandis is... Do you know who Tom Petty is? <laughs> yeah. Okay. A singer. Yeah. So I don't know who you didn't know. River Phoenix. Yeah, he's an actor. So... Or was. But anyway, so those are mine. Uh, Which uh, Joaquin Phoenix is going to be the Joker, right? Well, in, in a separate, yes, in the new Joker movie that may or may not be separate from what's going on right now. Oh. So what do you guys, because I know I asked you guys to just put a little bit together. So what, uh, what names did you have on there? Um, I had Michael Jackson, like you like I already said. Um, the other ones, these are a lot of these I put together before you came out with the new rule um, in the 12th hour of, or I guess the 11th hour is the... The uh, saying, saying, yeah. But what is it called? The idiom. idiom. The idiom. Yep. <laughs> um, but so before that, I had Albert Einstein, but he died at the age of seventy-six. Um, I had Leonardo da Vinci, but he died at the age of sixty-seven, clear back in fifteen nineteen. So I'm assuming, <laughs> yeah. <see? laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming that he was died of old age. Uh, Leonardo Leonardo Fibonacci, because we talked about him, and I just wanted to be like, did you really? just want to count rabbits or was there actually like more to it? Yeah. I'm glad I re I told you to, <laughs> to do the ones that just basically use as f- my role Didn't was kind of age. like the gone too soon's. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so then I also had Aristotle 
Oh, who good. was in 384 <laughs> BC to 322 <laughs> BC. He was 62 years old. Plato was 80 years old. The reason I wanted them was because I wanted to be like, just see what they really knew. Cause apparently they had something to say about everything. And then, so the one that I finally landed on after we got the new parameters was Steve jobs. Okay. And oh, the yeah. reason I chose Steve Jobs, he was 56 years old when he died. He died of pancreatic cancer. Um, he definitely died too young. But I was just thinking of like who has like a huge impact in my life currently who's no longer around and could have probably had even more of an impact. And Steve Jobs is definitely on the list. Because mm. um, obviously we use iPads, iPhones, all these Apple products that he was the founder of Apple, obviously, and he had all the things. And the one quote that I love from him um, that I actually still use all the time is, people don't know what they want until you show them. So anything, I mean, really, like it is true because I didn't know I wanted an iPhone until it came out. I didn't know I wanted an iPad till it came out, you know. So it's a cool concept, and uh, I wish there was more genius things that he would have come out with before he died. Mm. Alan. So the ones I had that were the same as you were, you said Chris Farley and Heath Ledger. Um, I also had this one. If I brought him back, it would actually be the second time he came back. And Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back Jesus. <laughs> Not because I'm super religious, but he seemed like a chill dude. He seemed like a cool carpenter. <laughs> Be like a hippie today. No. Um, you just wanted to see manna fall from the sky, huh? Oh, yeah. And turn my water into wine. Um, <laughs> uh, Stephen Hawking, of course. Okay. And he was he was getting up there, I guess, age wise, but it, still he had the disease which mm-hmm. contributed to his death. So you could say too soon. Uh, JFK, because that's a for good me, uh, he was obviously a great president, in my opinion. What he was doing um, at the time, and then getting us to the moon, like making that statement that we will land on the moon within the decade. And then they did, but he was assassinated we assassinated before then. And my last one is Amy Widenhouse, just so I could tell her that maybe you should, should have, have gone, gone to rehab. rehab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Awesome. Well, like I said, if there are some that we did not mention and others that you uh, would have liked to have talked about, or yeah, just uh, go onto our website, which is QCOPodcast.com. Be sure to let us know in the comments. You can also uh, go onto our Instagram posts or Facebook posts, which is, of course, at QCOPodcast.com, or not Q.com, but at QCOPodcast, and uh, let us know there. We'd love to interact with you. And then please also visit us uh, on our YouTube Page channel. or channel, gosh dang, I don't want to say page, and hit subscribe, and uh, you know, so and so that we can, you know, the more people we get there, the the more content we'll be able to start pushing out there. So yeah, uh, we'd appreciate that. And of course, don't forget to leave us five star review. But uh, thanks, guys, for listening, and we can't wait to uh, do this again next week. Bye.